Amen. We continue our study in Romans chapter 12, and I believe we left off last week at verse 9, where the apostle is giving some practical admonitions. And it is a, a really a, um, if, you, if you want to put it this way, it's a transition chapter from what he's been talking about to some practical matters that have to do with the church in Rome. He's been talking about the big picture questions, about uh, the gospel, about how the Jew and Gentile relate to God in light of the fact that there is the gospel that has taken the place of the law of Moses and how that works out between both groups. But now he's transitioning from that into more practical matters that have to do with the church uh, in the uh, most practical sense. And so in verse 9 he says, let love be without, the King James says, dissimulation. And the word is hypocrisy. I don't think we use the word dissimulation much these days, do we? Uh, dissimulation is about on the same level as concupiscence. We don't use those kinds of words anymore. Well, it's hypocrisy. That's what the word is. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. That's self-explanatory. Not much explanation needs to be done about that. Uh, that makes sense, doesn't it? But we live in a society where people want to do just the opposite. They want to cleave to that which is evil and abhor that which is good. And we see that demonstrated in so many different aspects of life. And then, verse 10, he says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. You could say that verses 9 and 10 is the new motivation that we have in Christ. We have a new motive to treat others the way we would want to be treated, really fulfilling the golden rule. But he says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and in honor preferring one another. You know, that's the antidote to church problems. I know that if you've been in the church long enough in different congregations over the many years that you have seen your fair share of church problems and they're never pretty. They're never attractive. They're always ugly when they come up. Uh, most church problems, and I say most, not all, obviously, but most church problems can be diffused if we simply put into practice what verse 10 says. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. In other words, I defer to you, and I hope that you will defer to me. And when we have that kind of disposition, that kind of attitude, there's no pride involved. Pride doesn't get in the way. The pride of life is never a problem when you've got this kind of disposition and this kind of attitude demonstrated by members of the church. Uh, that will diffuse a lot of bad situations if it is put into practice. Then it continues in verse 11, not slothful in business or in diligence, not slothful. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You've got to be industrious. You've got to be a person that is willing to do what needs to be done. Working is what we normally would call it. You know, you, some of you might remember the many loves of Dobie Gillis way back when. They so, show that uh, program every once in a while on TV land, I think. It has... Uh, Oh, uh, all of the different characters. And one of the characters was Maynard G. Krebs, played by the fellow that would go on to play Gilligan on Gilligan's Island. If you remember, he was a beatnik. And whenever somebody would mention work to him, he'd, he'd straighten up and he'd say, work, work, work. He didn't want to work. He didn't want to do anything. You know, he just wanted to, just to be slothful. He didn't want to do a thing. Well, I fear that that characterizes far too many today in the church. Uh, when you mention work, it's work, work, what are you talking about? Don't want to do that. Well, you can't be that way. You've got to be diligent, fervent, serving. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. Hope of what? Hope of eternal life in heaven. You take away hope 
you've taken away a great motivator for the child of God. That uh, sustains us. Hope sustains us. Patient or steadfast in tribulation. Enduring is the idea here. You got tribulation coming in from the outside, tribulation coming from the inside. And what do you do? You remain steadfast. Patient is what the King James says, but it's steadfast endurance. You persevere through it. You make it through to the other side. Continuing, King James says, instant or steadfastly in prayer. You continue in prayer steadfastly. Prayer is the lifeline of the child of God. If we cut off that lifeline, we've cut off a great sustainer for us in our Christian lives. Distributing or helping to the necessity of saints. Helping those who are in need who are members of the church. Of course, we know that's not limited to just members of the church. In other places, such as Galatians 6.10, where we are to do good unto all, especially those who are the household of faith. We are to help both saints and non-saints. But here, specifically, he mentions distributing to the necessity of saints. And then, given to hospitality. We need to be willing to entertain guests. Be of that generous spirit to those who come our way. Just like Abraham was when the three visitors met him at his tent. Uh, he went to work pretty quickly. He is instructing Sarah to fix a big meal for them and said, you just stay here with us. You know, he was willing to open up his tent, open up his uh, place to anybody that would come through. Well, you know, we ought to be given to hospitality in that way. Bless them which persecute you bless and curse not that's a direct reference back to what jesus said in matthew chapter 5 about those who persecute you do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you you know that's a tough thing isn't it we want to retaliate we want to lash out you know we want to be like rambo remember rambo part two where he was uh going over there to check ostensibly to check to see if the Vietnamese prisoners were still there and he found some and he was going to come back and they abandoned him and then he was captured by the Soviets as it turned out put into this uh, prison camp and they were torturing and persecuting him and of course he went all John Rambo on them and started retaliating and started uh, gaining vengeance upon all of them well that's what we are prone to want to do to those who persecute us you know get back at them retaliate You see the bumper sticker, I don't get mad, finish it out, I get even. Isn't that the attitude of too many? Yeah, and uh, too often that happens in in religious matters. But he says, bless them. And he says, bless and curse not. How do we do that? We teach. How do we do that? We preach. We speak the truth. And if that garners us persecution, then so be it. We continue to speak the truth. We continue to preach and teach the truth. You know, I don't recommend that people go into the Twitterverse, as I call it. If you do Twitter, you know what I'm talking about. You go into the Twitterverse and you look at comments on people's tweets, on famous figures, especially politicians. And it is eye-opening, to say the least, to see what some people, I say more than some, a lot of people, have to say in response to famous people who tweet. It's like going down the rabbit hole. It's just like going down a black hole of hatred, a black hole of retaliation. It's that mindset, that attitude. And this is completely opposite that. Bless them. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be there for them. Be there. If there's, some, if there's something going on in their life, that their lives that is tremendous, we need to help them uh, celebrate that. And if something devastating happens, we need to be there as a shoulder for them to cry on. Some some, as a consolation for them to take refuge in people who care, in people who understand. 
Then he says, verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. This is uh, this attitude that we're talking about. Then he says, mind not or set not your mind on high things, but condescend. The King James says to men, the text actually says to things of low estate that are lowly. Be not wise in your own conceits. That is a fascinating verse when you think about it. He says, be of the same mind one toward another. In other words, don't elevate yourself because of where you live, how much money you got, how much education you got, and blah, blah, blah. He said, don't, don't do that. Be of the same mind. We're all brethren. We are all brothers and sisters. The King James says, condescend to men or condescend to things of low estate. That's an indicative, uh, uh, that's indicative of being yielding. You yield yourself. You yield yourself to those things that seem to be of low estate. In other words, you are going to be uh, uh, led away, not led away as far as being led away from the truth, but you're going to be allow yourself to be led by those that the world would think are beneath you. But no, it's we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. James would pick up on this, or he already ha- I think he already had picked up on it because James is one of the earliest books written. James talks about the person that walks into the assembly with uh, fine clothes, and then another person walks into assembly with shabby clothes, and you have respect unto him that wears the gay clothing, and you say, the other person, sit thou at my, foot, at my footstool. And go ahead, and to the person with the big clothing, oh, come over here and sit in this high place. Well... He says, you are become, you're distinguishing in the wrong way. Well, this is the same attitude that James is talking about, uh, that James wants us to have, and Paul is talking about it. The attitude that we must have is to be of the same mind one toward another. Uh, Our attitude should be that that Abraham had when he discussed the matter with Lot about their herdsmen fighting among themselves. Remember what he said to him? We be brethren. We be brethren. Abraham said, you take whatever you want, and then I'll take what's left over. That was Abraham's attitude. He did not want there to be any strife. Let there be no strife between me and you, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we be brethren. That's the kind of attitude that fosters true unity. Now, we're not going to give up on matters of faith. We're talking about matters of consequence, matters of indifference. And he's going to further explain that aspect of it in chapter 14 when we get there. But here he's talking about the disposition of mind, the disposition of heart that should characterize brothers and sisters. That leads to good things and that never leads to division, never leads to uh, factions in the church. Then he further says, verse 17... Recompense no man evil for evil. That goes against the philosophy of the United States, doesn't it? That really goes against the philosophy of many, many Americans. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide or take thought for things honest or honorable in the sight of all men. You pre-think. He's pre-thinking these things. You think what is honorable. You think what is honest. In the sight of all men. That's your disposition. That's your mental attitude going into it. You're going to provide things that are honorable, honest, upfront is what we're talking about. And when somebody does you evil, don't pay back in kind. Don't say, I'm going to hit you back and I'm going to hit you hard. That's politicians' attitude. You know, you go into Washington, D.C., and it's a whole different world. I know that because our youngest son works up there. He keeps me up abreast of what's going on from the inside every day. He calls, or he texts, and he tells me the latest that he can tell me about of what's going on up there in D.C. And it's, it's just a through the looking glass kind of thing. You know, politics is, is uh, not for the faint of heart. And politics is a matter of of when you are, have something done to you, then you hit back and you bit hit back hard. Well, that's not the way it is in the church. 
And that's not the way it ought to be in our dealings with people on a general basis. Recompense no man evil for evil. Verse 18, now he deals with some practical, real practical things. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, I'm glad that the inspired apostle put in those two phrases right before he said live peaceably with all men. If he had just said live peaceably with all men, we could have said, Paul, you don't know some of the people I live around. It's impossible for me to live peaceably with them. But the Holy Spirit knew, and he inspired Paul to say, if it be possible, <laughs> as much as lieth in you. <laughs> he understands, the Holy Spirit does, that we all have our limit. We have our breaking point. And he says, if it's possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Some people you just can't get along with. You ever met anybody like that? You never have, have you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There are people that just, you can't get along with them. They won't allow you to get along with them. Well, Paul understands that. The Holy Spirit did too. So we cannot seek out strife. That's the, really the point. You can't be looking for strife. You know, I remember when I was preaching up in the Shoals area back in the 90s, there was a preacher that moved into the area that I just knew from name. And he and I talked on the phone when, after he got settled in. And we'd had about an hour-long conversation, I guess. And he told me that whenever he would go to a place to preach on a full-time basis, he would find out what they disagreed with him on, on even matters of con no consequence, and he'd get up in the pulpit and start harping on that from the pulpit. And I'm sitting here thinking, really? <laughs> you really have that disposition? And he had moved up to number of times. Surprise, surprise, shock of shocks. Well, you know, he's looking for strife. He's looking for something. Well, that kind of attitude, unfortunately, exists in too many places in the world. You have people that you cannot get along with. So he describes how we can live peaceably with all men in verses 19 through 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. As for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Deuteronomy 32, 32 is what he's quoting here. Give place unto wrath. In other words, set it aside as much as you possibly can. You know, anger is not condemned as such in the New Testament. Our Lord got angry on occasion if you recall. He became angry at certain situations, but he never sinned. Anger in and of itself is not sinful, but remember that anger is one letter short of the word danger. Anger, danger. If you give, play, if you give yourself over to anger and give yourself over to it too many times, you can start building up that wrath that's within. That fellow that shot those uh, people up in D.C. that got killed himself. He apparently was a very angry man. Very angry man. And he allowed himself to give over to wrath to the point that he was willing, more than willing, to shoot up individuals because they disagreed with him. That is wrath at its worst. And so he says, give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. The Lord is going to take vengeance on the evildoer eventually. He's going to have the final say. You know, there are some situations that are so complicated, it's going to take the Lord to figure it out the day of judgment. And there are some things that are unsolved these days. John Benet Ramsey case comes to mind. Uh, other cases that you can think of that are unsolved mysteries, well, they'll be solved the day of judgment. The Lord take care of it. He'll handle it. Uh, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Then he says, verse 20, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. 
If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. This kind of disposition toward those who would be our enemies melts away enmity. How can they be angry with you if you do good to them? Now, is that necessarily going to change them from being your enemy to being your friend? Maybe not. But it will help the situation in general, won't it? I wish you could have known my grandmother, my daddy's mother, who lived to be well advanced in years before she passed away. Well, the, the joke in the family was she was going to outlive all of us. <laughs> she lived that long. But Grandmother Hester was someone that believed in this passage. And I well would remember her saying, you'll heap coals of fire on their head <laughs> if you do this. Uh, she believed in that. And it's true. It works. It really does. If we put it into practice. Then he says, verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You know that's the antidote to wars. That's the antidote to lawsuits. That's the antidote to any kind of dispute that you think of. If you don't be overcome with evil, but you overcome evil with good. But then uh, we know the sad history of the world. Uh, in the 20th century especially, one of the bloodiest centuries that's on record because of first uh, the Great War, World War I, and then World War II, the Nazis and their uh, uh, horrible philosophy starting with Adolf Hitler of exterminating uh, entire groups of people because they considered them a bacillus, a pestilence upon humanity. And then after World War II, you had the communists, that took over Eastern Europe and threatened to take over the world and butchered tens of millions of people, even their own people in the Soviet Union and other countries. We still have communist regimes today in Cuba and Vietnam and North Korea and China that are still oppressing people. And then you have, of course, the pestilence, the scourge of abortion. Where in the United States, we consider ourselves a godly nation, a nation that is one nation under God, and yet we have butchered 59 million innocent lives since 1973. You think about all the tens of millions of people that have been killed in the 20th century, and most of it, when you're talking about wars, is because of not following what he says in verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When you've got somebody like Vladimir Lenin, who was completely against religion, Karl Marx, the founder of communism, said that religion is the opiate of the people. Sometimes he's quoted as saying religion is the opium of the people. No, he said religion is the opiate of the people. He considered religion just to be nothing. Uh, when you've got that kind of attitude and disposition, then anything goes in the name of your political philosophy. Uh, and we have seen the bitter fruit of that in the world. And even to this day, we see it at work. I just read about a North Korean soldier, a tw uh, North Korean soldier in his 20s that swam across the Yon River, I believe, the Han River, to the South Korea to defect. And that's the second South Korea, North Korean soldier in two months to defect to the South. Normally the rate is one per year. And they've had two over the last two months. That may indicate something's brewing. But anyway, we'll have to see. Overcome with evil. Don't be overcome with evil. Overcome evil with good. When it has to do with the Lord's church, that kind of attitude of heart and disposition leads itself to unity. It never leads itself to division. And then in chapter 13, he deals with some more practical matters. But chapter 13 shifts emphasis to the Christian and civil government. Now, we're going to be spending a little bit of time in chapter 13 this week and next week because you just can't blow through this chapter. There's a lot of different... Uh, approaches to this chapter I have my definite approach and I will uh, let you know that pretty quickly I'll just let you know up front I believe that a Christian can go to war 
Uh, I believe a Christian can serve as a policeman. I do believe a Christian can serve in government, but there are limitations to that that I believe. But still, I do believe that a child of God can serve in those capacities. There are good brethren on the other side that say a child of God cannot go to war, that a child of God cannot serve in government, and so on. And they try to use Romans 13 as the justifier for it, but I don't think they can. Because if you read what Romans 13 says and put it together with the other passages from the New Testament, I don't believe you can sustain that position. But we need to make sure that we understand in chapter 13 that Nero was the ruler when Paul wrote these words. Nero, if you know your Roman history, was one of the most despicable rulers that Rome ever had. But if you know anything about Nero himself, you know that the first part of his reign from about 54 to approximately, oh, the early 60s, I guess, was relatively peaceful. There wasn't really a lot of things going on as far as persecution from Rome or, or any kind of strife going on because according to contemporary historians, Nero was being positively influenced by a very influential person that was close to him, that was keeping his passions, his instincts, his base instincts in check. And then what happened was this person died, whether that person was poisoned or killed or whether that person died of natural circumstances, is really not sure. But after the death of that person or persons around Nero, then he began to give himself over to his base instincts. And it was at that point that he began to persecute Christians, especially in Rome. And you read about how it got to the point where he would impale Christians on sticks, douse them in lamp oil, and set them on fire in his courtyard. Now you talk about depraved, you talk about insane, that's it. You may have heard Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Well, he really didn't fiddle. He actually played the harp. He played the harp while Rome burned. He instigated that burning of Rome and then blamed it on the Christians. He hated Christians that much. Well, that was at the latter part of his reign. And what we understand from history outside the Bible is that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter were both executed under Nero's order before Nero died. Well, at the point when Paul was writing these words about 55, 56, this was early in Nero's reign. And so you've got to keep that in mind once we read this. And also you've got to make sure that you understand that this applies to all time, not just Paul's day. But the words that he says here about the Christian and civil government apply to all time. Now, I will tell you up front that David Lipscomb, the preacher, uh, is an individual that I highly respect uh, for his knowledge and for all that he did for the Lord's church in a critical time in our history, 19th century into early 20th century. He founded Franklin College, which would later become David Lipscomb College, then David Lipscomb University. Uh, David Lipscomb, the preacher, was a very modest person. Uh, he and uh, his wife lived in a uh, uh, well, a wooden house, a uh, log house on the camp, what is now the campus of David Lipscomb University. If you drive up there to Nashville, you will see that very house they lived in driving through the campus. Uh, he was a man that was, uh, had tremendous conviction about the truth. But I can say to you that I completely disagree with his views on civil government. Uh, David Lipscomb wrote a tract that was published and has been republished and republished and republished over the years, picked up by generations that are not familiar with him, uh, on the Christian and civil government where Brother Lipscomb advocates the view that you cannot have anything to do with civil government. The civil government was actually part of Satan's realm. And he goes back uh, to Genesis to try to prove that. And it's really not fair, I guess, to Brother Lipscomb to synopsis, synopsize his views that way, but I'm just sort of giving you a thumbnail sketch. Um, he did not believe that a child of God could participate in politics, period. Um, and his views, quite honestly, were influenced by the Civil War, living in Tennessee as he did and seeing the devastation that happened in Shiloh and then 
uh, Fort, well, Fort Donaldson first, Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, then coming down to Shiloh, and then over in, in the McMinnville area at the Stones River, and then in uh, Chattanooga, uh, Chickamauga Battlefield, uh, actually in Georgia, and then Chattanooga itself, and then, of course, the war moved north in the latter stages to Nashville where there was just some horrible, horrific battles that took place in Franklin and then in Nashville itself where uh, the army that was under John Bell Hood's command and the Confederate army was a shell of its former self and they were just cannon fodder, throwing themselves against the well-entrenched Union armies that were uh, ready for them and it was just a slaughter, a slaughterhouse. Uh, Lipscomb witnessed all of that. His views on civil government were heavily influenced by that, and why not? I mean, when you see war up close, when you see the devastation of war up close, it will turn you against it. But he went a step farther than that, saying the child of God cannot be involved in it. That does not mean that Lipscomb was not divorced from politics altogether. When he became editor of the Gospel Advocate, James A. Garfield was elected president. Remember, Garfield was a member of the church. He was actually disciples of Christ, but they were part of us at that point. Now, Garfield also took the view that uh, instrumental music was fine and that the missionary society was okay. So he was not a conservative. In fact, he also believed that we, are, we evolve a biological evolution. So he had his own issues. But there's a big thing about uh, Christians running for president. We need to support a Christian running for president. That's always good for a Christian to run for president. And if you recall, James A. Garfield was a Republican. Well, the pen of David Lipscomb went to work after Garfield was elected. And he said, and this is in essence summarizing. He said, okay, all of you who I'll call for Christians and good men to run for high office, it says you've got your man as president. And he's a Republican. <laughs> he was a big Democrat, you know, in the solid South at the time, Democrats. He knew the right notes to play. So he wasn't divorced from politics altogether. He knew about all of that. But he himself advocated the view that a child of God cannot be involved in it at all. Well, that is a view I do not take. I do not take that, that, that position, and I will explain as we go through uh, chapter 13. He begins... Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Does that just apply to the United States of America? Does that just reply, apply to a republic? Does that just apply to a parliamentary uh, democracy? No, it doesn't. It applies to every government that is on the earth. See what that includes? That includes dictatorships. That includes communism. That would have included Nazism. Wait a minute, you're saying that the Nazis were ordained of God? That the powers that be are of God, including the Nazis and the communists? Well, hold on a second. Providence is involved in a lot of this. Think about the Old Testament times. Think about the, peop the men and the governments that God used for his purposes. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians. Were they godly people? Why, no, not at all. If you know anything about the Assyrians... The Assyrians were probably the most brutal empire that had ever existed until the Nazis came along. And that's not an understatement, by the way. The Assyrians were totally brutal. In fact, I think, I can't prove it, but I believe that uh, Hitler was probably influenced by the Assyrians. If he knew anything about his world history, he probably took note of the way the Assyrians conquered and were able to expand their empire. And I think he probably had that sort of attitude. But at any rate, God used godless governments to accomplish his purposes. Now, if a godly person was living under those empires and under those governments, would they have to be in subjection to those governments? Why, yes, as much as possible. And it's the same way today. If a child of God is living, say, under the North Korean regime, 
That child of God has to worship in secret because the North Koreans are not going to allow them to worship openly. It is a good thing that the, uh, that the Chinese communists are now allowing in certain places members of the church to worship openly. There is a church called the Peking Church or the Beijing Church of Christ, the Beijing Church of Christ that meets but with government approval. Uh, and so in certain circumstances, some of these regimes will allow the church to openly meet and worship, which is good. But if they did not, then the Lord's church would still be meeting in secret. But an, uh, up to that point, they are going to be obeying the government in every way possible unless and until they said, you must stop doing this. And then in that case, we must obey God rather than man. I remember when I was in college in Freed Hardeman, how that there was a gentleman that came to the Henderson Church building on a Sunday night to talk about uh, the work in Poland. If you remember the early 1980s, Poland was communist. And the solidarity movement was gaining a great head of steam, uh, opposing the communists there in, in Poland. Well, this missionary happened to be, an, a, a, maybe not a friend, but uh, he knew General Jaruzelski. If you remember that name, General Jaruzelski was the de facto leader in Poland, communist. He actually was able to meet with Jaruzelski because of his personal relationship with him and get permission for the Lord's church to worship without fear of persecution in the nation of Poland. What he told all of us that night was, if the Roman Catholic Church is allowed to have free reign in Poland, you will have a situation where it will be worse for the Lord's church under the Catholics than it is right now under the communists. Now you think about that one for a moment. That's an unusual circumstance. But the fact is, the child of God must adjust to the circumstance in which he lives in. He must be subject unto the higher powers. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. If you defy the government, if you openly try to overthrow the government, then you are resisting God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. And then the question arises, well, what about the American Revolution? If a Christian were living under the times of the American Revolution and they supported George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in the Continental Congress, would they be in violation of chapter 13? It is my conviction, it is my belief that they would not. The reason? Because if you know anything about your history, it is about the history of the Continental Congress, the history of Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and George Washington. They had been trying for at least five to ten years prior to 1776 to have their grievances redressed by the British government. And time after time after time, they were rebuffed over and over and over. So what did they do? they decided to formally announce that they were going to break free of Great Britain, but it was through legal means. They did not want war. Now, a few of those in New England wanted war with Great Britain, no question. But as a whole, the Continental Congress, the First Continental Congress and the Second Continental Congress did not want war. They wanted to have a peaceful resolution with Great Britain and simply free themselves of that and form their own nation. That's hardly revolutionary talk. But King George III over in London wasn't, wasn't going to have it that way and decided to come in with an iron fist and suppress it before it even started. But if you know the process of what happened, that was not a violent revolution against an established government. It was by legal means, by lawful means, a nation declaring itself to be independent. And by 1776, the colonies were already in all everything but, or every, uh, independent in everything but name. They were doing things on their own, by and large. And it wasn't until King George sent over his British armies that war actually began. Well, I believe that uh, the Re American Revolution was legal. It was not a revolution in the sense the communist revolution took place in 1917 where they were violently overthrowing the czars in Russia. Uh, it's a different, different kind of revolution, if you want to call it that way.
But if we decide that we're going to throw our lot in with anarchists and those that want to overthrow the established government today, that is completely a violation of Romans 13. If you're going to have change politically, you need to go through political and legal means to try to affect that change. And that's a different thing altogether from what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about a practical day-to-day -day life. You need to be subject to the higher powers because of the fact that God instituted those powers. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or judgment. Well, this is where we will stop. We've gotten through two verses of chapter 13. We might get through the first section of chapter 13 next Sunday. We'll just see. Uh, but it's a very interesting subject. It's a very critical subject to discuss. And um, I've got my convictions. Some of you may have your convictions on the subject. If you do, then uh, if you want to say something, that we can, we can have an open discussion about it. I do not believe it to be a matter of faith. I don't believe it to be a matter of fellowship. Uh, so those brethren that disagree with me on that, I have no problem with it, as long as we don't push it to a matter of, of fellowship. But having said all that, we'll continue our discussion on this next week.